What Happens in the Woods is a true crime podcast. We discuss events that are often violent in nature. Listener's discretion is advised. From August of 1992 to January of 1993, a serial arsonist was wreaking havoc throughout the Seattle area. Investigators were pooling all resources to be able to find the person responsible for the destruction to every type of business and building imaginable. There were neighborhood watches, beefed up police patrols, even a multi-county arson task force was created. But it was one lucky break in a family member's suspicion it would lead to the downfall of the person known to the task force as Spectre. This is True Crime Podcast, What Happens in the Woods, with your host, Justin Bryce. Let's get started. Hello, campers. Thank you so much for joining us today for another episode. How's everybody doing? How are you doing, Bryce? I am awesome. <laughs> okay. Awesome. I'm awesome. You're super, thanks for asking. Yes. Uh All right. So it's a week before Christmas when this drops. Hopefully everybody is finding time to enjoy themselves. They're not rushing around everywhere trying to do last minute stuff as we will be. Yes. Always last minute. Not always. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) We are always the last minute people out shopping at like, you know, five o'clock on Christmas Eve. No. I feel like we are. No. I feel like we do every year. Every year. I don't know. Maybe this year I'll be able to get it done sooner. There's always, I guess there's hope. Yes. Yeah. If you hear any noise in the background, it's the dogs. They're they're completely wild today. They're playing like musical chairs and up on our laps and they just want to be... I don't even know what they want. I don't know what they want at this point. It's chaos. All right. You have you have anything to share with us, Bryce? No. Not a not a thing. No. All right. Well, we'll just get right into it. If you're ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, cuz I would hate to silence you in any way. Stop it. <laughs> All right. Um, So this one begins in early August of 1992. Fires began randomly popping up in outlying Seattle neighborhood Linwood on a very frequent basis. On August 6th, a small subdivision of unfinished and unoccupied homes was set ablaze. Several homes were just completely destroyed. Investigators found that these fires had been set using a lighter and tar paper, so just random things that were found. They had the lighter, the person did, but, you know, they would gather, uh, you know, things, wood, whatever, materials from the job site. site. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. And um, set it it on fire. Yeah. Just days later, on August 9th, two churches, the Linwood Alliance Church and the Trinity Lutheran Church, were targeted, as well as another new construction home. While the Lutheran church was completely burnt down, n- nothing was salvageable. The only um, like minor damage to the Linwood Alliance church was just damage to a, a shed. It never actually caught, like a blaze never actually caught. Yeah. But this list just continued to grow. So that month, there are a total of 13 fires that are believed to be started due to arson. And that's not including any other fires, any other um, emergency services, anything else. That's just due to arson, which is kind of overwhelming when you think, you know, how frequently emergency services are called for, you know, accidents in the home or, yeah. you know, heart attacks in the home or, or whatever, car accidents and, you know, things like that. At first, investigators aren't certain that there's any connection between these fires yeah. Due to, you know, the seemingly randomness of the locations. Unfinished homes in a subdivision, churches, a lumber yard, storage facilities, 
some fires never fully ignite and others, you know, decimate the building. None had any accelerant used and the fires were all started at like a mid to high level. So, you know, somebody's chest or, or shoulder area, depending upon how tall the person was. So they would stack things up and then set it on fire. There was roughly $4.3 million in damage that month that was attributed to these fires. The next month saw the same, even more um, suspected arson-related fires. And with these fires, the stakes were raised. The arsonists began starting fires in occupied homes. Oh. A family with children ages nine years old and six weeks old would lose everything, but they made it out just in time to save their lives. There were also businesses and unoccupied and unfinished homes in subdivisions that were caught on fire, set on fire. The area where the fires were being started was various and unconnected. Started in Linwood, moved down to Seattle, moved up to Everett. It was everywhere. It was different neighborhoods all the time. And as fires, firefighters would show up to deal with one fire, two or three more would be set. Everyone was fearful as it became progressively worse and it was more frequent. Neighborhood watches were set up. Police stepped in. There was routine patrols. There was use of helicopters. They were, you know, everybody was on alert. And still, even with all of these precautions, the person responsible would go unchecked for months. Pretty early on, there was a task force that was formed between Snohomish and King counties, uh, since that was the primary area where these fires were being set. And it was formed in partnership with the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And this was headed by Lieutenant Randy Litchfield of the Seattle Fire Department and Special Agent Dane Wetzel of the ATF Bureau. Profile was done to try to understand any motive to setting the fires as well as uh, something to put out to the public to help the arsonist. There was a hefty reward of $25,000 um, that was offered to anyone who could help identify the perp- uh, perpetrator. And they set up you know, a toll-free number trying to garner any leads. On September 28th, a fire was set at Anderson Retirement Home that would give them the first and really only piece of evidence that investigators ever got. Thankfully, the retirement home had a pretty good um, sprinkler system in it. Yeah. So that stopped the fire before it compl- completely like damaged the building. No lives were lost, but you can imagine plenty of people were in a panic. Oh, yeah. You know, I, can you imagine old people trying to get out of a, a building that's on fire with sirens? blaring and you know they most definitely found that this fire was started purposefully uh, when evidence showed the perp had removed a window screen in an empty room and set the bedspread on fire they were able to get two fingerprints from that screen however the prints i mean that's only useful if you have prints on file to compare them to, yeah. which they did not. Um, or, you know, if you have a suspect in mind that you can get prints from, they did not. Mm-hmm. So running the prints in the database revealed no hits to a match. Over the next three months, there were dozens more fires set and they were everywhere. Multiple times a night, firefighters and emergency services would be rushing from site to site, attempting to save lives, save homes and businesses Up until this point, there had been no reported deaths associated with any of the fires set by the arsonist, but residents were barely making it out alive, and they were making it out with nothing and watching their homes just be destroyed. There was one family in Linwood who had seven young children that they rushed to get out of their burning home. Another um, older grandma, 90 90 years old in Snohomish County, had to um, get help from her neighbors. She wasn't able to make it out on her own. And thankfully, her neighbors were were able to get into her home and get her out. In that one night alone, there were 12 fires set. Wow. Investigators think that they have a break when a couple calls in a potential lead um, in the case. So they're parked in their car and in, in the neighborhood. I'm not sure if they were out front of their house. It just stayed in, uh, stayed in a neighborhood. And they witness a well-dressed man talking on a what they think is a cellular device, a cell phone. 
um, go in between two homes. And he disappears for a few minutes. And then he reappears quickly, making his way to his uh, sedan, four-door sedan, and he rushes off. Moments later, they see flames engulfing one of the homes. And they, you know, rush to call emergency services. They can't give a really good description of the man. They just state that he was, you know, taller, had darker hair. He was very well dressed. Didn't really see his face. Yeah. Again, they assumed that it was a phone that that he was speaking on that he had up to his to his ear, basically. Mm-hmm. But that caught the attention of the investigators. They begin describing the shape of it. And what it turns out to be is not a cell phone, but a a police scanner. Oh. Yeah. So now they know that, you know, this guy is one step ahead of them all the time because he can hear everything that's going on over that scanner. And he's listening to make sure that where he goes next, there's no police. He obviously he knows where he set the fires. Yeah. He's he's moving basically where they're they're not. not looking. But he's also guiding them to where he wants them to be. Oh. Eventually, this guy gets sloppy. He's, you know, he's setting a lot of fires. He's racing from place to place. He's not paying attention to his surroundings and who's watching him or who's around. In November of 1992, two more people would get a look at a suspicious man near the area where fires would break out just minutes within the sighting. On November 2nd, a man told authorities he spotted a newer Chrysler sedan quickly drive away from a warehouse and then make a U-turn only to duck into a side street and park and wait. Moments later, fire trucks show up, sirens blaring, you know, they're responding to a fire in the building where this man had just left. The man was parked in the car watching the entire scene as firefighters desperately worked to put out the fire. The description of the car was a great lead, but at first it wasn't any help. The witness gave a description that was a newer car with temporary tags and a Chrysler advertising card in the window. I really didn't know what that was, but I guess companies would loan out their cars like, you know, dealerships would loan out their cars. Mm -hmm. If you were willing to advertise like have a advertisement uh, card while you're driving it around. So like you would, you would be advertising for them, basically driving around town. They would let, you know, people drive for a couple of days in these cars. Okay. So uh, just it's, a test drive. Yeah. It's kind of a weird thing. That but is weird. It, you know, you got to think in the days before the internet really was big on, you know, not everybody had a website. Not everybody yeah. had subliminal you know advertising everywhere you go Mm -hmm. those were everybody would see a car you know if you're in a car and you're driving on the freeway you're noticing other cars you might catch this advertisement card yeah yeah so they notice that they give a description of of the car and that as much as they can so this gave investigators the idea to contact dealerships because you know it had it had oh yeah tag like temporary tags so it was obviously a new car somebody had just bought it and they also contacted advertising firms in the greater seattle area to see if any connections could be made but no leads actually came of that days later investigators received another tip from a woman who had an odd encounter with a well-dressed gentleman while standing at the scene of a fire that was being battled by firefighters this woman claimed that a man got out of his car came and stood close to her and was just completely consumed with a fascination as the fire raged on. It just struck her as very odd. And she was able to provide the police with a description and partial numbers to the license plate of the car. So the car, it wasn't an advertising car anymore. Was it a regular car? It now had plates. Was it a Chrysler? It was a, it, well, she... They say it was a Chrysler. Oh, okay. Yeah. As the months went on and there was no end in sight to the number of fires the arsonist was setting, emergency services, firefighters, police forces, and just about every person in the Seattle area, they were exhausted. Multiple fires were being set on a daily basis, 
tips were coming in, but nothing solid that pointed to a person or persons responsible. So they decided they were going to think outside the box to to try to get some more leads, better leads. Yeah. At this point, they don't have anything. They really have nothing. Yeah. They brought in the woman who had given them the partial plate numbers to try a, a very controversial method of hypnosis to help do a composite sketch of the man that she had seen. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, it was a big risk, and they decided to take it because in doing so, I mean, this made her not able to be a creditable, um, credible witness yeah. if you know this went to trial. If they actually found somebody and it went to trial— she would not be able to be called upon because of this, you know, giving this sketch in this manner under hypnosis. Yeah. And they knew that. They knew that this was a huge risk. What they were hoping was that if this sketch released to the public got better leads, then they wouldn't need her. Yeah. And that would be okay. So they did a total of three sketches. Very different looking, but similar things. Two of them had a mustache. Two of them had glasses. It, they they made it so that there was enough similarities, but enough differences so that anybody who really had a good lead would know which one was the actual sketch. Mm-hmm. And, you know, would that would lead to the real person. They released this along with the profile information that had been generated by the FBI on January 28th, 1993, while sitting down to read his morning paper in Linwood, Washington, George Keller took one look at the article with the sketches and the profile, and he knew his world and his family were about to collapse. And I will tell you why when we come back from this break. To look at George Keller and his wife, Margaret, now, all you would see would be a loving couple who've raised three children and now dote on their growing grandchildren. The two have been working in Christian evangelical work for some years now, feeling a deep love of God and wanting to spread the Christian uh, message to everyone through their example and service to others. You would never guess that their oldest son, Paul, is considered one of the most prolific serial arsonists in United States history. On that morning in January, when George was reading that newspaper article on the front page of the Herald, everything changed. As mentioned in the article, There were three composite sketches and a list uh, for the FBI profile. The heading read, quote, someone knows this person. And yes, unfortunately, someone did. George knew that he was reading and looking at a sketch of his oldest son, Paul Keller. Paul had been a very troubled person going back to his early childhood. Born on January 6, 1966, Paul Kenneth Keller survived birth seemingly by a miracle. His umbilical cord actually had become untied, so separated from the placenta. Yeah. And, well, separated from him. And it caused a loss of blood and oxygen to his brain. Okay. He survived. Doctors assured the family that they had a healthy baby boy who should not have any long-term lasting effects. However, as their family expanded, it was very evident that something was not right with Paul. As a child, he was violent. He was mean. He seemed to fear no consequences of any of his actions. Yeah. And there was no remorse. After his sister Ruth was born, he seemed to delight in being aggressive towards her. When his parents would try to correct or punish the behavior, they say there was no sense of acknowledgement and wrongdoing. They could see in his eyes that there was no connection. After the third child, Benjamin, was born, it only became worse. And there are there's several accounts of, you know, incidents of violence against his siblings that Paul incited. Some of the worst being uh, choking and nearly drowning his sister. Wow. Yeah. Um, causing an accident with Ben. He was just a toddler at this time. Uh, he ended up splitting his femur bone vertically. How? In one leg. He got tripped and the way he fell. And he was placed in a full cast on one side of his body. He's a toddler. I don't even know what to say. Uh, Exactly. George and Margaret began to live in constant fear that something was going to happen. They were constantly on the edge. 
They never knew what Paul would do and when he would strike. Yeah. The couple turned to doctors and specialists for help, as you do, hoping that there would be some answers to help Paul. And, you know, they're wanting to keep their other children safe, but they, of course, love their son. They want to help him. Paul would be tested over 50 times in various ways, according to Margaret, and the answers they sought were never found. Finally, Margaret brought Paul to see a neurologist, hoping that the specialist would have answers. Yeah. But again, it was just a disappointment. While Paul was diagnosed as a very energetic t- uh, child with ADHD, actually, at, at that point, I don't think they called it ADHD. I think it was just ADD. Yeah. They didn't have that that distinction he was placed on medication and the only offer of advice to her was quote you're you will be long suffering parents basically suck it up yeah your kid is going to be a nightmare and there's just shit that you can do about it good luck here's some pills here you go yeah and basically in a last ditch effort they sent paul to a camp for troubled children which I'm sure did absolutely nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Because those always work. Those always work. Around the age of eight, George noticed that Paul had a fascination with firefighters and trucks. And the family I mean, thought it was odd. Well, uh, I mean, I guess it wasn't a healthy one. No, it was not. No. Um, this is weird. Because, I mean, most kids, you know, like admire firefighters or police officers. Yeah. Or- yeah. yeah, I mean, they're they're heroes, you know, you see them putting themselves in danger to keep you safe, you know, the public safe. Yeah. That's what kids see. They don't, they don't, um, you know, yeah, it's very idealized when you're a child. That's, yeah. that's just somebody you look up to. They're, yeah. they're helping people. And isn't that great? You know, that's, that's what kids see. That's what they want to. They want to imitate. They want to be like that. They want, they want to emulate. To, yeah. yeah. Well, the the family thought it was odd that he would be so hyper focused on these things, but they encouraged it because it seemed to alleviate his violent tendencies. Mm-hmm. If Paul heard sirens or horns, he would get, hop on his bike. He would race to wherever he thought he could, you know, catch up with the f- fire trucks as they're going to a scene, and and watch them. Eventually, George gifted him a police scanner, and soon Paul was showing up at every fire that he could get to. And again, the family found it odd, but it was a welcome change from his usual behavior. Until it came out that Paul was caught setting fire in a vacant lot next to his family's home. His parents, of course, were very upset by this and ended up having the firefighters give him like a huge lecture on fire safety. They're hoping to, you know, get it through to him. This isn't a joke. Yeah. This isn't a play thing. This is serious. You know, you're you're potentially causing damage. You could have caused damage to your own home. It's just next door in a vacant lot. Yeah. And and at, at this point, most of the firefighters recognized him because he had been showing up to every fire that he could oh, go to. Oh, so he was okay. So he was I mean, he was known to these firefighters. He would talk to them, he would you know, asked to ride the trucks. He would go in. Yeah. He knew these firefighters. So his parents were like, Hey, can you really have a serious talk with him? This is, this is not good. This is not, you know, okay. No. As Paul got older, his interest in fires did not diminish. The family was very active in their church, uh, Trinity Lutheran church. Paul would spend time visiting the elderly and being of service to others in the congregation But he always made time to visit fires, and he loved to take tours of the fire stations. He was particularly interested in the equipment they used and had even begun collecting items that he found at scenes. Okay, that's weird. Yeah, and I'm not talking like small items. Like if they were overhauling a firehouse, he would try to take whatever he could from that, including like... If they got a new truck, he'd like to have the old siren or the light, you know, large things, large items. After high school, he was hired on as a security guard with a local company, but he he couldn't hack it. He tried twice to become a firefighter, 
Um, he was volunteering. And of course, like I said, he knew everybody. And he was hoping to make it on with a firehouse. But he was asked to not come back volunteering uh, twice. And he was never able to make that work. Why so is that? They gave him a second chance because he was not there to actually distinguish the fires. He uh-huh. was there to geek out over the fire. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like he, his attention was not in the moment. Let me help put out this fire. Oh, so he was more, he wanted to watch it burn. Oh yeah. Okay. Eventually, he would meet a young woman at the church he was attending at the time. And in 1989, the two would marry. There's literally no information about her. Um, huh. And, I mean, I guess good for her. She She's kept her name away from his. Yeah. Unfortunately, by 1990, Paul was divorced and he was filing for bankruptcy. Wow. He had also been let go from his accounting job after he had set a small fire under his desk. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You would think all this would be just like red flags for everybody. Yeah. You would think. Yeah. Knowing that Paul would not recover from the loss of, you know, this reference in his employment. Plus he's under, he just filed bankruptcy. has a lot of debt and he's divorced. So he's, you know, feeling pretty shitty. George made the decision to have Paul work at the family's advertising agency. His other two children already worked there, and being a loving father, he wanted to help his eldest son however he could. And when he spoke to a, a, you know, to this plan to Margaret, she had very different feelings on the matter, and she she was against it. The family was finally free from under the stress of Paul's violent and unpredictable behavior, and she feared that the stress of him being there would just bring that all back to their lives. And, you know, their other two children. But George dismissed her concerns and to his detriment, he brought Paul in to work at the business. And at first, things are great. Paul seems to be hitting it off with all the clients. Business was good. He, you know, was uh, basically an overachiever. He was really into like presenting himself in the best light possible and Mm -hmm. just wanted you know, wanted to achieve things and wanted to be successful. The family was still on edge around him, um, but tried to just, you know, kind of let him do his thing and stay out of his way as much as possible. But little cracks in the facade soon began to appear and his temper was making more and more appearances. He became unpredictable. One day when entering the office, Margaret interrupted Paul and Ruth, his sister, in the hallway arguing. And Paul was uh, actively like trying to choke her. Oh, wow. Yeah. The second time in her life that her fa- her um, brother has attacked her and tried to kill her. And if Margaret hadn't come in when she did, there's really no way of knowing if he would have stopped. And if Ruth would have, you know, been able to walk away from that. Yeah. Margaret went, you know, to George with this information right away. She was pleading with him, please, you know, let, you've got to fire him. He's, he's, he cannot be here. And George just, he couldn't do it. And he, you know, had a good talk with Paul and set some, some hard boundaries and was very stern. But in the end, he just said, you know, you can't have this type of behavior here. And um, I, I don't want to have to fire you. Yeah. Yeah. And then the fires began. And the beginning of August brought new troubles to the Keller family as fires were popping up all around their home in the town of Linwood. Their longtime church was targeted and completely burnt to the ground. That's the Trinity Lutheran Church. Oh. The community was in a panic as months dragged on and roughly 107 fires were started yeah, that's by a this lot. arsonist. That's a lot. Yeah. In a six month period of time. And on that cold January morning in 1993, George Keller recognized his son in that sketch in that article. He read the profile and the details fit. And I, I can't imagine facing that fact. I, I can't imagine knowing that, that there's a good possibility. This is your son, you know, that you love and, and you, you know, is troubled, but you want to help. 
you don't want them to do this or be this. Uh, yeah. I'm just wondering if he knew all along, like this was his son doing this. I, if he didn't, I, I just don't know. I mean, I don't know how you, how you couldn't have, and I'll kind of explain why. Ev- everyone in the community, I mean, everybody in the, the western part of, of Washington knew, you know, the damage that this person had Im- inflicted, had, mm-hmm. had caused. And I just, I can't imagine knowing that, you know, your son is this monster responsible for these people losing their homes, their businesses. And, and it, yeah, it's an incredible thing to reconcile. And yeah, if you had suspicions all along, or if you even had one suspicion, yeah. you ignored it and things kept happening. There is um, some information in the news reports that conflicts what I read in a book. So the news makes it out to be George who was solely responsible for recognizing Paul and turning him in. Yeah. However, I read a book the anatomy of motive, the FBI's legendary mind hunter explores the key to understanding and catching violent criminals by John Douglas. He relays in that book that it was the younger brother, Ben, who actually first caught a TV report the day prior when they held a press conference and mm-hmm. actually first released those sketches and the profile. Yeah. So according to him, Ben then contacted Ruth and was like, Hey, do you think this is possible? And from there, I'm not sure who suggested it or why she got the thought, but she looked up gas receipts to the credit card statements that Paul had. Oh, Ruth did? Yeah. And placed, could place him in the town where the fire started on the days that they started by these receipts for business expenses. A a born detective. Well, she's married to a, a Snohomish County Sheriff. Okay, you didn't say that. Well, I that was information that I like barely got. Yeah. It's not really mentioned. But yeah, I'm not sure. It, it's just conflicting because according to every news article out there, it's only George. George saw, saw the newspaper. George then decided to see if it was possible that it was his son. And then George took the information to Margaret and they, you know, prayed on it for a day deciding what to do, what they needed to do and what the best thing to do was. And then the next day he turned him in. Yeah. So I'm not sure. I mean, I find it hard to believe that, you know, John Douglas, who's this very well-known FBI, you know, agent yeah, would put information in his book that wasn't true, but also every news outlet reported it completely different. So I just mentioned that it, I mean, regardless of who did it the next day, George, made probably the hardest phone call of his life and he turned his son into the authorities. He met up with the lead investigators of the Snow King Arson Task Force. Mm -hmm. He brought a picture of Paul down to verify that it matched the correct sketch. There was only one sketch that it would have matched. And, you know, they knew that they had their guy. It fit. So for about a week, the family kept quiet about their involvement with the police and the arson task force. And they, you know, that allowed the task force and the police to do a little more digging, make sure that they actually had the right guy. Yeah. At one point, Ben, um, Paul's younger brother, almost went behind his parents' back and told Paul to drive away and never look back. He felt so guilty about having to turn him in. He didn't, thankfully. Yeah. But Paul must have had you know, an inkling of, of what was going to happen or what was happening. Probably. I mean, this was all over the news and I'm, I'm sure he caught when that, you know, people were closing in on him. I'm sure if he saw that sketch, he would have recognized himself. Yeah. Um, so he actually makes up a, uh, fake girlfriend that he's going to go visit in like Oregon. Mm hmm. And says he's going to leave the state. And uh, his parents kind of panic. And they, they, Margaret ends up calling him and saying, hey, you know, we're, we're going to have this family dinner. You can't leave. You need to be here. Yeah. And it was the last dinner the family would have together. In the early morning of February 6th, 1993, police came in full force to Paul Keller's apartment. And they made a show. 
Taking a page from the FBI and John Douglas, they had dozens of police vehicles with lights and sirens going. They formed a motorcade, taking him into custody, taking him to the station. Paul was then met by Lieutenant Litchfield in his full dress uniform. Of course. Waiting there as well were both of his parents, George and Margaret. And before being let into the interrogation room, George gave his son a hug and said to him, quote, they know everything, son. They know everything. The interrogation room was plastered with photos of Paul, crime scene reports, findings, pictures of the desolation the fires had created at the scenes, and maps detailing any and every fire location throughout the counties. And it was all set up to flatter the man that the task force had named Spectre. That was their name for him. The ghost. Yep. And eventually it worked. There is some video that can be seen of the questioning. And at first, of course, Paul completely denies anything. You know, that's it's natural. People accuse you of doing something. You're like, yeah, no, I didn't do that. Not Not me. me. But the more the detectives flatter him um, and play at his ego, the quicker he begins to talk. However, he does make some very troubling statements, uh, such as, quote, I'm not the criminal type. Quote, I wouldn't hurt a mouse. And, quote, I'm not a bad guy. And my personal favorite, quote, I'm not the guy you should be putting in jail. Dock my insurance or something. Oh, wow. It isn't long before Paul confesses to around 76 fires out of the suspected 107. That's it? 76? 76. Uh, That's not unusual. Yeah. All in all, the damage he is thought to have created was over $40 million. And they really never get a motive. They never get really a a reason. Paul kind of confessed that he was drunk and using drugs a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, which again, how do your parents not pick up on that? Yeah. You know, you're working with them. How are you not showing that? He did tell the investigators that after he set the fires, he didn't feel anything but sadness. Uh, it didn't bring him any joy, any happiness to set the fires. Yeah. But he kept doing it. But he, he really never offers any more of a reason. It's, it was just, he did it. And that's that. So he's quickly arrested and he's held on $1 million bail. Originally, a trial date was set for April of that year. But on March 5th, he ended up pleading guilty to 32 counts of first degree arson. And the Snohomish County Courts put in motion the proceedings to sentence him. There was a mention in his court records, um, from the little that I could see, that there was uh, 15 days he spent at Western State Mental Hospital, and I'm, I'm sure he was being evaluated. Yeah, I was going to say, for evaluation. Yeah, especially since he pled guilty. He was released from there and then went on to be sentenced May 28th, 1993. He was sentenced the maximum allowed 75 years and sent to uh, Clallam Bay. During his sentencing, the judge commented on how much emotion and distress that she had seen on everyone's face in the courtroom while the victims were able to give their statements. And that took the better part of the three days of the sentencing. Most of that was just the victims coming in and being able to give their same statements because there were so many. But not from him. There was no reaction from him. And she didn't feel that he was in any way remorseful. And so she had no problem giving him the maximum sentence of the 75 years uh, with no possibility of parole. After his sentencing, his father, George, gave the one and only statement that the family has ever given during this time or since. Um, He stated, quote, all of our lives, we will be sorrowful for your pain, your loss. May God in his grace help all of us, end quote. Now, up until this time, it was thought by everyone that there had been no deaths associated with any of these fires, right? Oh, yeah. This was actually one of the only bright sides to all of this for his family. They, you know, they had a really hard time dealing with the fact that their son had caused so much devastation to the communities. They saw what he had done, how it, you know, people were suffering because of it. Yeah. But they felt like, okay, you know, we love him. We know he did wrong. He's paying for it. But at least he didn't kill somebody. And that would all change when Paul made a confession while serving time that a fire set on September 22nd, 1992, 
at the Four Freedoms Retirement Home in Seattle was his responsibility. And we've spoke about the Four Freedoms before when uh, Lady Monica yes. ended up murdering um, that gentleman. So unfortunately, the Four Freedoms is in the news a lot. Wow. Yeah. During that fire, unfortunately, three elderly residents would lose their lives. So Bertha Nelson, age 93, Mary Doris, age 77, and Adeline Stockness, age 72, would all die as a result of that fire. And because of this new charge, this was made in King County because that is where the Four Freedoms is located. Most of the arson was committed in Snohomish County, so they prosecuted him there for that. So he pled guilty to two charges of murder and entered an Alfred plea on the third charge due to the victim, um, Adeline Stockness, died of a heart attack as oh, because of the fire. Because of the fire, the stress. Right. Um, not from smoke inhalation, which is what the other two passed away from. So originally, he had been charged with three uh, first-degree murder charges and one first-degree arson charge. They dismissed the arson because he was already convicted of arson in the other counties. Yeah. But yeah, so the Alfred plea, if you remember, is the same plea that Michelle Notek entered, which results in no trial. And it's really not an admission of guilt. It's just stating that, yeah, my actions probably caused someone to pass away. Probably. Yeah. But I'm not going to admit that, that I did that. Yeah. yeah. Which, side note, she's due to be released next summer. I, I'm still... Very upset about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So on December 28th, 1993, Paul Keller was sentenced and received 107 years to run concurrent to his arson sentence of 75 years, with parole not being a possibility now until 2079. So more than likely, he will be passed by yeah. that time. So he basically got a life sentence without saying he got a life sentence. Exactly. Exactly. Currently, he is being held at the Monroe Correctional Complex. Some odd things that I kind of wanted to add that didn't really make sense in the you know telling of the story was, first of all, all the court records for him are completely sealed. Really? Yeah. I could only look up the date of when things happened on both of the county like court records websites. Yeah. Um, but there are no documents available for the public to see or, or try to get. I wonder why. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I really don't know. <laughs> and it, it, it kind of is one of those things that I don't think is right. Yeah. But there you have it. Another thing I wanted to mention is that George Keller received that $25,000 reward for t turning Paul in. Oh. Yeah. Um, the family did not keep the money, though. They instead donated all of it to the Trinity Lutheran Church to help them rebuild. Rebuild. Yeah. They, in turn, lost everything after Paul was incarcerated. Clients pulled out of their advertising business. They lost the business. They lost their home, their family home that they'd lived in for decades. Mm -hmm. And they lost their savings and were left to rebuild their lives, much as the other numerous victims that Paul affected. You know, only they had their physical belonging, belongings as where these people were left with nothing. Yeah. Several other people did receive rewards as well. They were, they were much smaller, mm -hmm. you know, ranging from like $1,500 to about $3,500. For all that, you know, tips and information that got called in that was viable information that just didn't unfortunately pan out for, for people. Mm -hmm. Speaking... About that, too, it turns out that the car, um, yeah. you know, there was that advertising, that card. advertising card in the car. Yeah. So as they were calling dealerships and advertising agencies to see if the description the witness had given could get them any leads, they did actually talk to George Keller. Unfortunately, they had the car type wrong. It wasn't a Chrysler. It was a Dodge. Oh. And. It did have an advertisement card in the window. However, it didn't match the connection, like the description that the witness had given. Yeah. Which I think was because Paul would switch it. 
he would take that card out and switch it with something else. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm um, trying to. Mislead. So that wasn't tied to his dad at all. Like, well, you know, the advertising card. No, because George, when they called the task force called him and said, Hey, you know, have you any knowledge of this type of car? And, you know, is your advertising agency doing these, these type of cards that look like this, that would be an advertising card Mm -hmm. and cars. The description was not anything he recognized. So he said, no, unfortunately that doesn't, he said, yeah, we do have, my son drives a car that's very similar to that, but it's, it's a Dodge and I don't have any advertising cards that match that description. Oh yeah. So I, you know, there again, yeah, you should have had an inkling then that maybe something was up. And even though they didn't have the right information, Mm -hmm. maybe Paul was, was, you know, connected somehow. Yeah. Maybe, and maybe they did, maybe he did get an uneasy feeling from that, you know? I, who, who's to say, I don't know. Um, the next thing I'll mention that it, it's triggering. So I want to give people an opportunity to skip ahead just a couple minutes. Um, I read a couple of mentions that while giving interviews after his incarceration, um, Paul claimed that he was sexually assaulted as a child. Of course you would. Well, it's conflicting though. One stated that it was a firefighter and another stated it was a family friend who held him at gunpoint. And it's not something that uh, can be confirmed. Uh Paul states that he didn't want to mention it anytime sooner because it is not the cause of why he did anything related to the fires. So he didn't want to mention it in court. He didn't want to mention it as an excuse. He said it was unrelated, but he does in later interviews discuss it. And if you are interested the Keller family tells their side of events in an investigation discovery show called Evil Lives Here, which I've mentioned a couple of times now. I'm not purposefully getting case episodes from this show, but they just happen to have episodes for some reason on things that I've already been researching. Yeah. Um, this was the first time in 24 years that the Kellers have spoken publicly about Paul and how this played out for them. As I said, he gave that, George gave that statement after his sentencing and, and they never talked about it to the public again. So to be honest, it's, this is not my favorite episode to watch. They are very religious, very religious. Mm -hmm. And, and that's fine. I'm not knocking that at all, but it kind of reminded me a lot of my religious upbringing of, you know, the hallelujahs and the praise gods. And I, I was uncomfortable watching it because it's a TV show. You're yeah. talking about what your son has done. And they started by praying in the episode. And I get that that is their, their faith and that is their belief. I, I don't want to diminish that. For mm-hmm. me, it was slightly uncomfortable and it might be for others. So I didn't, I, the show I thought was interesting to watch from their perspective, you know, yeah. for them to give their perspective. That's why I mention it. But just be prepared if you do choose to watch it, that it it is very religious. They're they're they are based their lives are based in in their belief system, and that I hundred percent that's great for them. I, it just some people may not feel comfortable watching that, so that's all I I say that for. Then there was also a CBS movie of the week made in nineteen ninety five. Um, it's titled Not Our Son. And Neil Patrick Harris stars as Paul and Gerald McRaney is George. And I started to watch it. There's like, it's split into parts on YouTube. All I could find was part one. And if anyone has watched any of those movie of the weeks from the eighties or the nineties, you know, they're painful (laughs) to watch now. (laughs) Yeah, they are. Yeah. The dramatization and the, you know, the, the, leeway that they take the leniency that they they take in telling the story it's all for the dramatic purposes and i of course they're there for the views yeah so um it it, it's there 
it's it's somewhere to be able to watch. I'm sure you could probably find the other two parts of it, or or I don't know. Was it it was interesting. Not our son. Not our son. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is the arson task force, the Snow King arson task force, actually received awards for their like investigations and and how they went about trying to find this arsonist mm -hmm. and and you know finally finding him and and the the amount of work that they put into it, you know, the fire departments that were involved, the just the man hours involved in in trying to keep the community safe. Um they received multiple awards um and commendations okay. for for their service and for their their hard work and all of that. And that was in 1994. And that is the story of Paul Keller, the serial arsonist known as the Spectre. Pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah, because I think most people, when they think of arson as a victimless crime, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, someone's just out there setting fires. I don't think we usually associate that with death, you know what I mean? Or mm -hmm. murder or anything like that. And And I, you know, it's and that's something I thought about. It's just like, well, while you're telling that story, I'm like, okay, so he set a bunch of fires, but it, you know, people think of it as a victimless crime, but he caused like at one point, I guess you said forty million dollars in damage. Yes, and um, I think that's why I thought of it that way. It's like, oh, it's just a bunch of insurance scams, and you know, people just collecting insurance, and yeah, they can rebuild a house, but you can't rebuild a life. Yeah. I mean, I guess you, <laughs> it's a cynic in me because it's, you know, we usually talk about serial killers or murderers or. Right. No. And, 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 and then you go and throw in this. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was a little bit different. And that's why I, I wanted to, like, I wanted to throw it in this season because I, there is kind of that running thing that we have going on of, of looking at other perspectives you know, the family's perspectives of these criminals, yeah. um, you know, the other perspective of, yes, the arson and fires are are typically looked at exactly how you said. They're victimless, victimless crimes. Yeah. But I, I think it's important to remember just how easy it is for them to become crimes that involve death. Yeah. And I, I would hate... I think that's probably one of my biggest fears is to completely lose everything. You know, like the, the families in Kentucky that, that just those tornadoes, Mississippi, all of that area where the tornadoes just went through Yeah, the devastation that that caused in a moment's notice. What do you take? You take your loved ones. Yeah. You don't go in and try to search for, you know, your high school yearbook or, you know, the flowers that you got from your wedding or something like that. You take your loved ones, you take the people yeah. and you try to get to safety. And that's the same with fires. You know, it, you, you can lose potentially everything. Oh yeah. And like the paradise fires, that town is still gone, yeah. you know, in California. It's, it's never, it's never rebounded or come no. back. Yeah. I mean, an entire town gone. Where we lived in California, fires every summer, people losing their homes, losing, you know, livestock, losing family pets, losing everything. And it's devastating. But, yeah, you think of it a little bit differently than you do, you know, just this crazy psychopathic killer on the loose who's who's stalking women at night. It, there's there's a, a weird distinction that we tend to make with that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I mean I think that's a really good point and that's that's pretty much exactly what I was thinking why I was interested in it. Yeah, cuz you know, even the the Paradise Fires, you know, that wasn't set by an arsonist, but No. You know, they it was a culmination of things. Mm -hmm. But you know, people are oh, they're just displaced. People's lives are disrupted. Like you said, Paradise never came back, so those people have to pick up their lives and just move it somewhere else. And it's not right. like the, it was their choice, you know, it was right. Yeah. I mean, watching that show on Netflix, I know we're getting off on a, on a tangent here, but just how fast it spread and how people had to make life decisions. 
Right. And, and you know, you don't have time to think about it. It's like now, cause that fire moves so fast. Yeah. It's yeah. It not was, a victimless crime. It's, it's not. And I think that it's important to remember that any crime, even if it is not resulting in a death, there are victims of every crime. Yeah. You cannot say that, I mean, there's different levels, of course. There's, you know, that that's why they classify things in first degree, second degree. There are different levels of, of crimes, but you just can't, you can't think in your head, oh, well, it doesn't matter yeah. because, you know, nobody was hurt. It, it does matter. It, it matters to those people yes. that, you know, that went through it, that survived it. It, it does matter. So, you know, just just a little food for thought there, I guess, to really, like I said, look outside of, of your normal, what you normally think of as crime. Yeah. Yeah. And I was really interested to read the Mine Hunter book. Mm-hmm. You know, the John John Douglas's book. Oh, yeah. I, I I like looking at I mean, I love I love the show <laughs> getting on another tangent. I when is the next season coming? God no. for the love of God. But that really makes you think, you know, somebody somebody innovated that and, and I really want to pick his brain. So I've been slowly making my way through anything that he has been you know, his name is attached to a book or an article or anything I've been trying to go through. I, I definitely recommend trying to consume it. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, there's only so many hours in the day. There's, only, <laughs> I yeah. don't have time for everything as much as I want to. I don't have time for everything. And some days I just need a break. So if anybody's interested, uh, of course we're going to link, I'll, I'll try to find a better link to the movie if anybody wants to watch it, but the investigation discovery, if you have the ID discovery app, you're able to watch it for free on that app or, you know, you pay for the app, but you, you can watch it on that, on that service. If you do want to purchase the service, I believe that Amazon you could buy per episode. So I'll link to that. And the book, I, I definitely recommend the book. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting to try to research and get more information on that, on this guy. And his parents still go visit him as much as they can with COVID. They they were not able to, of course, but his parents will still go visit him. They, you know, ask for prayers for him all the time. I read on their Facebook page, people were like, surely he's paid his uh, his time now and he they would let him out. No. No. No, his time is is still going and yeah. the judgment was he was not to be paroled. So, you know, by the time he's ready for parole, he probably will have passed. So, no, he has not paid his debt yet. Yeah. He is not. And and I'm sorry that that, you know, is probably hard for the family, but he is not. And the judgment stands. That's that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, on a lighter note, we hope that everyone has a wonderful holiday season, whichever holidays you celebrate. Please, you know, just stay with your loved ones, stay safe. We are so incredibly thankful for all the support we receive from you guys. And we just, we want to really say that again. We appreciate you and we wish everyone well. Make sure to let us know your thoughts on this case or any of the other ones that we've covered. And we will be back on the December 31st, the new year, the start of the new year for a special bonus episode you won't want to miss. And as always, guys, we just want to say stay safe, be kind to one another, and stay out of the damn woods. Stay out of the woods. Especially if you're going to set fires. Yes. Stay the fuck home. Bye, guys. Bye. What Happens in the Woods is an independent podcast and is managed and produced by Gospel for the Rebels, LLC. Research and content are presented by host Jessica, with all editing and producing done by your favorite resident techie, Bryce. We believe in transparency and will always list our sources and information in our episode notes. We are always looking for new cases and stories to tell. We welcome your interaction with us on Facebook and Instagram at WHIT Podcast 
and at Twitter, what happens in the woods, I N T two. Or if you prefer, our website is what happens in the woods.com. The campfire is open to all. Thank you for your continued support of our podcast. If you love us and want to continue to hear us bring you episodes, please share and like us wherever you can. But the best way to help us grow is to hit all five stars and review us on whatever platform you get your podcast fix. Until we meet again, campers, stay safe and stay out of the damn woods.